dan si pa ko yak ka kia o na nascom na wao ye tong ka pen do tawinan hello everyone i'd like to thank you all once again for coming to listen to us i am joined today my name is Gerald McMaster by the way uh today i'm joined by my co-curator Nina Vincent who is uh, joining us and who currently lives in Paraiba in the northeastern part of Brazil and she works with the historical and the artistic intangible heritage of uh, of Brazil so we are pleased to welcome Tanya Luke and Linklider to Wapata's second in conversation event which is part of a series of the Arctic Amazon project knowledge exchange workshops and uh, it's in support of the upcoming publication Arctic Amazon Networks of Global Indigeneity. This series is developed by the Wa our Wapata team as part of our Global Indigenous Outreach Initiatives, which are which is led by Brittany Pitilak Bergen and Natalia Chestapalova. The virtual uh, event series today and this particular series is hosted by the generous support of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council Connections Grant, the Appleton Foundation, Nancy uh, McCain and Bill Morneau, Ian and Kiki Delaney, Michelle Kerner, and Michael O'Dane, and in collaboration with the Power Plan Contemporary Art Gallery here in Toronto, the Arctic Amazon project will come culminate in several milestones. The first is a major publication titled Arctic Amazon Networks of Global Indigeneity. And second, which is an online educational resource hosted by the Wapata Center. And third, this coming fall in September, September 30th, the Arctic Amazon exhibition in partnership with the Power Plant Gallery of Contemporary Art and the Ryerson Image Center. Now I'd like to introduce Tanya. Tanya Lucan Linklider, does performances, works for camera, installations, and writing center on the histories of indigenous people's lives, lands, and structures of sustenance. Her performances in relation to objects and exhibitions, scores, and ancestral belongings generate what she has come to call felt structures. In two, uh, 2022, her solo exhibition, My Mind is With the Weather, will open at the Oakville Galleries in Oakville, Ontario, and will tour to the Contemporary Art Gallery in Vancouver and the Southern Alberta Art Gallery in Lethbridge, Alberta. The work is currently on view in, in the What Water Knows and Land Remembers, which is the Toronto Biennale uh, of art for 2022 and she will also participate in this year's uh our aichi triennale sorry uh, which is in japan and uh last year in 2021 she participated in the soft water hard stone at the new museum's triennial uh, that's the museum in new york city and in Soft Power, a conversation for the future at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. In that same year, in 2021, she received the Herb Alpert Award in the Arts for Visual Art. Tanya is Alutik, Supiak, and her homelands are in the Kodiak Island Archipelago of Southwestern Alaska. Welcome, son, Tanya. Thanks. You were just in California working on a project. Uh, remember last week we were talking with you. Can you tell us more about the project that you were engaged in? Well, I was uh, participating in an art artistic residency at Cal Arts, um, which uh, was uh, in relation to the Herb Alpert Award uh, that I received in 2021. Uh, and so I was undertaking some studio visits with graduate students, um, giving some talks, but also uh, writing a great deal and visiting the Pacific Ocean, uh, which was important for me as someone who is uh, an island person and who hasn't been to the ocean uh, 
for about two and a half years until mm. until that time uh, due to the pandemic. So I was writing a great deal about a project that we're going to be speaking about a bit later um, and, and visiting visiting the Pacific Ocean as much as I could as well. Well, speaking of the Pacific Ocean, and it's uh, it's just amazing that each time I fly over it, sometimes when I head to to Australia, but um, uh, this is going to be the formation of what I, I'd like us to talk about in the next few moments, because in 1964, the state of Alaska, where you were born and raised, experienced a massive earthquake, which became known as the Good Friday, which is this coming Friday, by the way. <laughs> But in 1964, it happened on Good Friday. It was called the Good Friday earthquake. And as a little boy, I remember uh, just coming off the res and yeah, into the city uh, and watching on television this, uh, this amazing earthquake, which I never knew about its magnitude. And I now hear that it's, uh, it has been the most powerful North American earthquake ever recorded. This is massive massive uh amount when you when you actually listen to scientists talk about this earthquake and it lasted for about four and a half minutes i just imagine the four and a half minutes of terror of those who were affected by it and and uh in a work that you did a, a few years ago back in 2018 and which uh, we'll be showing at the in the exhibition the arctic amazon exhibition a work which uh, you call they fall the ground beneath you, and it concerns the moments of the of the earthquake and how it affected Alaskan indigenous communities, which, of course, I never knew back then as a young boy. But the, uh, this work features there's two parts to this film. The first is a personal response to to the earthquake itself, and then the second part of it is in response to a, a fellow Alaskan, an Alaskan who's in the exhibition the Arctic Amazon, and that's Sonia Kelleher Combs. So, can you tell us? the stories, for example, that we just never hear about uh, by the local indigenous folks uh, from, uh, as I understand it, the tribal archives? Yeah, um, so I, at the time I didn't realize my sister had um, spent some time with the tribal archive as well and gathered uh, sort of really looking at not only the experience of the Great Alaska or Good Friday earthquake and tsunami, which destroyed our village of Afognak um, and a number of other low-lying villages in Alaska and devastated cities like the small city of Kodiak and, and other cities um, uh, in Prince William Sound or, or Anchorage. Um, there were you know, impacts uh, sort of in that entire region um, and elsewhere. Um, that I don't know as much about, but I remember seeing some of these photographic images as a young person, as a youth, um, and they're quite uh, remarkable. Uh, but my sister had had was thinking about this move from our ancestral village of Afognak to Port Lyons, which was built sort of in response. And so she had spent some time in her master's paper really looking at that shift from uh, one village to the other and, and what that meant for our community members. And not all of our community members chose to uh, relocate to Port Lyons, but our family did. So or most of our family did, our immediate um, and much of our extended family chose to relocate. But I was around the 50th, just after the 50th anniversary of the, of the earthquake, I was writing, um, I was writing for a course with, um, my mentor, Dylan Robinson at Queens. Um, and it was a course on indigenous and settler affect and writing. And so he really gave us the space to write in relation to histories or what was, you know, what are, some of our concerns were. And I was really thinking about this, this shift in our world, you know, which was one of many shifts that have happened over time uh, for our Lutuk or Shulkabiak people. Um, that there's this sort of series of ways in which our universe or our world was kind of upended, um, first and foremost with uh, Russian imperialism or, um, you know, subsequently a number of colonialisms that have, you know, happened um, on our island. But I wanted to center the story in, in the experience of um, members 
um, of our community. And there had been a number of oral histories that had been gathered and are available on the Native Village of Afognak website um, that's administered. And as a, as a member, I have access to um, those, those oral histories. But I also remember growing up asking about it sometimes um, with my family. And so those oral histories describe the strange behavior of animals. They describe the, the ash falling as well, like, like snow. Um, or actually, I'm, I don't know why I'm thinking of that, but that's actually another ex experience. Sorry, I'm confusing the two. Um, but they describe also the way in which the ground was moving under their feet for extended periods of time and, and the sound of it, the sound of it as well. Um, and in my own family, there's a description of um, how my grandmother, uh, my late grandmother, Zenaida Sheratine Mukin, um, carried my auntie, my youngest auntie on her back, who was three at the time, and um, the kids were following behind. So the rest of the, my aunties and uncles and my dad were following behind her and they had to sort of race across this lake that was still frozen, but was breaking up behind them as they were running towards the mountain, which is where they all stayed for three days. And my dad also describes this in the archive, um, this, this um, getting to high ground uh, because they knew that the, that the tsunami was coming. Um, and it completely destroyed the village. And then they describe sort of coming back down to the village after the three days and just everything, you know, they could see the lines where the water had come in the buildings. They had a brand new community hall that was broken up and was destroyed. Um, there was just this, this kind of devastation that I think was, um, you know, sort of unknowable in a way um, until it happened. And then as someone who's a descendant of you know, my family who experienced that, in a way it's unknowable for me as well. So I'm just trying to sort of gather those histories and place them within this, um, this work, They Fall the Ground Beneath You, um, which is a, a work for camera. I guess also the thing that really stayed with me was thinking about the way in which my grandmother, you know, saved her children and, and how what her role and responsibility was in that moment, even though I'm sure she was deeply afraid and I don't know what she was feeling. Um, but it really made me think about my role as a mother, as a relative, as an auntie, um, and sort of my responsibility um, for my children and for um, the youth that are also sort of in my life, um, the kind of way in which uh, I'm in relation to them and how I care for them and and how I also need to tell these stories so that they'll know that this is um, this is what happened to a Fognac. This is what happened to our people in a Fognac. And now our family lives in Port Lyons and that's the village we visit mostly. Um, so it, it's a kind of a significant experience encountering the oral histories in the tribal archive. And I do contrast that with um, a series of stories that are sort of reprinted or retold in the Anchorage Daily News, which really focus on kind of wealthy upper middle class folks in Anchorage. And so these other stories are held within the tribal archive or sort of on the periphery. And for me, because the Fognac in Port Lyons is the center of my world in so many ways, that's where I go in order to learn about, about that shared, felt, and lived history with our people. It is really remarkable. Um, this, this really, you, you can see this process of uncovering narratives and how personal it is for you in this work. And of course, seeing it, you can see that you chose to, to show this young girls and women um, in, in this uh, film. So can you tell us more about who are this, uh, these girls and these women and um, the way you chose to, to show them, um, their hands and why, why they are uh, shown like that in the film? Yeah, so the two of the um, youth are um, 
so they're youth and children, so some teenagers and some preteens. Um, two of them are my daughters, um, Mina and Sasa, and then the other two, one is my niece, Tessa, and one is um, our, our little cousin, Keisha. And I was thinking about, um, like I said, sort of this role and responsibility of myself um, as, a, as an Alutik or Shokhbiak uh, woman and relative, but I was, I've also been thinking sort of longer term about um, women's narratives. And um, so I, I wanted to, you know, center that. But I also wanted to ask them some questions. So while I keep the film silent or the work for camera silent, we had a series of conversations about their experiences because I really feel that Oftentimes we think about indigenous knowledge as being transferred from elders to younger generations, but in my experience, it can also go the other way where um, young people have so much to teach us and we have so much to learn from them. Because if we think about lived experience as one of the ways in which we um, learn or, or how we come to understand the world, they also have lived experience at a different time and a different context that they can share with us. I find that they're, you know, so much further ahead in some of their thinking than I was at their age or ages. And so we really talked about their experiences um, in education. Um, we talked about histories. You know, some of those experiences are difficult. Um, they talked about you know, experiences of racism and sexism within their classrooms or within the education system. And then we started to think a little bit about what it means that, you know, their grandmothers um, are survivors of Indian residential schools in Canada. So I wanted to keep the conversation silent because I didn't want to fix them in time and sort of their thinking in this moment. Um, I wanted to kind of keep that uh, for them and for that moment uh, with each other. Um, but I just speak sort of broadly about, about that conversation. Um, and then I was interested in how in Alaska Native dance, um, we tell stories with our hands, we gesture, we use gesture quite a bit. And so I kind of saw this as an opportunity to sort of um, abstract it even further. So I, I consider um, Alaska Native dance and abstract form because if you don't know um, the stories you're watching the movement and sometimes you'll have you'll understand parts of it but but I also just enjoy it as a form it's a beautiful form it's a you know it's humorous and everyone dances from very very young until very very old um, and we have you know some phenomenal athletes and also some very nuanced dancers who are incredibly <laughs> funny. <laughs> but um, I was interested in the ways in which um, we also tell stories with the body, you know, and how we tell narratives through embodiment. Uh, but I wanted to make it also accessible for the, for the, the girls, many of whom are dancers. They dance um, fancy shawl and um, jingle dance. Uh, but I, I wanted to sort of work with them. And then sort of the last component was um, this material, um, uh, which is uh, a material that I had specifically made by Anang Beam. Um, she's the daughter of the late Carl Beam and um, she's on Manitoulin Island. Some of you might be familiar with Beam Paints, which is this really um, amazing uh, business that she has where she's sourcing materials and she's making um, paints and it's it's just it's quite wonderful <laughs> uh, but I had asked her to make copper um, to make a copper material that could be placed on their body that would be safe and so she did she did she made that specifically for this and I was thinking about copper partly because I live in Nibisi Anishinaabek territory um, I live in a place where uh, I'm familiar with, and I've certainly been able to witness over time, uh, different Anishinaabe uh, women water walkers. Um, and of course, I'm familiar with um, uh, Josephine Mondeman's uh, water walks around the Great Lakes where she would carry water in a copper vessel. And partly, uh, I don't understand the sort of full complexity of that action, 
but partly, um, you know, she's sort of speaking for the water, speaking with water. And there are many um, Anishinaabe teachings around water here in this region. And so that's kind of a context um, that continuously sort of is present for me living in this territory. I was thinking about um, how those teachings, the little that I know of them, um, as I'm not from this region, but that they speak about um, they speak about the water, the the need for the connection between women and water, and um, and so I guess in a way I I wanted to also sort of um, honor these youth and these children and 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 gesture towards that. In this instance, of course, the water is um, in the story of of what happened to Afognak. The water is destructive. Um, uh, so it's kind of a complex, it's a complex project in that way. Mm -hmm. um, you speak about the uh, connection to women and water. Uh, I want you to now tell us a bit about that connection with Sonia Kelleher Combs, because uh, as I said, she's a fellow Alaskan. She's in the exhibition of the Arctic Amazon this coming fall. And uh, there was some inspiration, I believe you said that uh, what is that connection maybe I think it'd be quite interesting to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, so um, originally this work was made uh, for this exhibition, which you're seeing an image of right now, um, which was at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. And there were a number of um, curators, uh, Mindy Bisa, Manuela Wellachman, and Candace Hopkins. And Candace had asked me if I would consider making a work in response to um, an artist within the exhibition, which I've done in the past um, in different instances. Um, I've responded to the work of Bo Dick and Rita Latandra and also placed myself in relation to histories of Maria Tulci. And so when we went through the list of artists, I immediately wanted to um, respond to the work of Sonia Kelleher Combs, who is I just really s deeply respect her practice and uh, through this process was able to learn more about her practice and how um, she spends a great deal of time on, at fish camp um, and on the land with her family, with her extended relatives, um, and how she also um, brings a number of objects into her work that are directly from the land, that are found by her family members or herself. Um, and how she's sort of working in this relationship or this continuum be between older forms of um, artistic uh, work, such as sewing, uh, which I also deeply respect, um, and sort of her, her really contemporary practice. And so my response was twofold. One was this work for camera, They Fall the Ground Beneath You, um, which you can see installed um, uh, which was installed on a, what I call a performance platform. And then the second was a performance with two dancers uh, in the exhibition, specifically sort of in relation to uh, the video installation, but also in relation to um, this work by Sonia as well, which is on the wall, um, Orange Curl. And uh, these performances are often site specific and are thinking about architecture and are thinking about sort of what's in the space. And while we took as our primary point of departure, Sonia's work, um, you'll notice that there are other works in the exhibition. Uh, so Marie Watt, um, Chinupa Hanska Luzier, um, and then there were other works by Jeffrey Gibson and other folks as well, um, sort of in close proximity. And so all of that came to sort of inform um, that performance. Um, okay, I'll do a big shift now to an, another uh, work that uh, well, I want to talk about. <clears throat> uh, but before we talk about it, because I think it has uh, some relevance to the story I want to tell, uh, because I think there's uh, the, the connections of, of just, just, I don't know, there was something powerful about a story I once heard that uh, I wanted to use as an example of what I call indigenous visual knowledge. It's about uh, California, an elderly uh, California basket maker. 
who was teaching a class of students. And I can only assume they were non-Indigenous students. I mean, they could have been Indigenous students as well. And they were being shown the traditional forms of basket making. And so over the course of a few days, um, uh, as they were uh, going through the process, they'd be gathering grasses. They'd go out, they were of course out on the land, gathering grasses, various types of grasses. But at each stage of the process, it required for the lady, the woman to sing songs, right? And as I said, this went on for a few days until one day in almost exasperation, maybe one student puts up her hand and says, uh, when are we gonna be making baskets? <laughs> she says, all we're doing is singing. And the elderly uh, woman, the teacher says, you are making baskets, you are. And uh, she said, because a song, the songs that we're singing, a song is a basket made visual. And I just, I, I, I often found this response to be uh, remarkably profound in its simplicity for it gave me, it seemed to give me a way to view our ancestral belongings, which are in museums. And I've seen them in museums around the world. And each time I go into a museum, it seems like these cultural belongings feel sad, right? And they just feel unconnected because they've been uh, disconnected from the source communities. They've been disconnected from songs, for example, and uh, they just, there's a, some, something lifeless about them sometimes that I see. So museums and art galleries, as we all know, are very interested in them as objects, not so much as in their songs, for example, maybe that's changing. But anyhow, in your work that you created, the second work back in 2019, an amplification through many minds, which was done at the Phoebe Hearst Museum in San Francisco, you encountered ancestral belongings, your ancestral belongings. And so tell us why this encounter was so special for you and how it became a basis for the video. Yeah, so this is a kind of unruly project and it's difficult for me to speak about because I'm writing about this right now and uh, I feel as though there are so many components of it or parts of it that are all sort of connected and so it's a bit difficult uh, to speak about because the question is um, really sort of a significant question I think in my life right now in terms of the ways in which I'm reconnecting with ancestral belongings and, and sort of activating them in the pro present moment. I guess I think a lot about how they used to be within our homelands and with our ancestors, with our families, with our relatives, with the land and the water, with the weather of my island. Um, they were in this sort of set of relations with the world around them and for many of us we you know i know that there are different kinds of belongings you know some are highly energetic and highly they have a, a shua or a spirit or a personhood or agency and some have different kinds of energetic exertions and so i tend to work with belongings that aren't necessarily considered, you know, quote unquote, sacred, only because our people are, you know, recovering from and, and sort of in this mode of, of repairing ourselves after um, sort of the violence of Russian imperialism and ongoing colonialisms in America. And so we're sort of in this space of uh, that we don't always have a, a framework for the way in which to interact uh, with these belongings, although some people do, and they feel comfortable doing that. And I think each of us have sort of different roles and responsibilities and in, in those sets of relations that we undertake in those visits. Um, many of my people have visited collection storage spaces over the decades. Um, one of the first uh, was my relative, the late Helen Semyonov, who traveled to the Alphonse Pinart Museum um, in France or she was the first one to go to that particular collection in my understanding. And, you know, I would read about these encounters that, that people had and sometimes I would hear about them. 
um, our people when they when they went and they would when they encountered masks or or other belongings they would weep at times they they talk about feeling a presence you know with those belongings and so in these encounters there was something that was happening you know that was happening between them and between the belonging and so I've been thinking a lot about that for many years and this as well as a couple of other projects I've been able to begin this process of visiting collections and encountering um, encountering belongings and in that can encounter that's what I'm sort of documenting you know I'm documenting that experience of of my encounter um, as well as others encounters um, one of the sort of key ideas that I'm working through is you know, the museum is weatherproof and it sort of suspends the ancestral or cultural belongings in a specific time, you know, through preservation and through repelling, you know, humidity and, and water and, and repelling uh, pests as well. So there's this placing of, um, you know, DDT and arsenic and other materials on the belongings that make them... Uh, then a little bit harder for us to interact with. You know, we have to wear gloves and we have to be mindful when we're interacting with them. And the places that they stay in are difficult as well. You know, they're often, you know, in darkness most of the time uh, for decades. And if we believe that they have energy or personhood or agency or shua, it's a difficult life for them, you know, over those long periods of time. And so when we visit them, I don't, I don't know if activating them is actually the right term. Um, <laughs> it's more about this sort of reciprocal exchange that happens between us where we're sensing and listening and being in relation. And they're also speaking to us through the designs on their bodies, through um, information that's been left to us by our ancestors. And I think a lot about how we're spending time with those belongings to decipher um, information that has been left to us by our ancestors. Um, so sort of broadly, that's why this project is important. These, um, I interact with uh, Alutic or Shukviak sewing bags from my island, as well as an Alutic or Shukviak um, parka, and also, um, that's for some reason, it's really uh, overly lit right now, the image. Um, it's a little bit of a better image. <laughs> I'm not sure what's happening, but uh, maybe we can try to adjust the image. Um, but, uh, and I'm also interacting with um, belongings that are not from my island. So they're Anangan, they're from the Aleutian chain, they're baskets. Um, these were collected through trade with the Alaska Commercial Collection. We don't know the names of the makers and we don't know, we don't have a lot of information um, regarding them. We have some information. And so uh, in this work, I'm thinking about how we um, are with them and alongside them in relation to them and how we also bring weather to the museum um, through uh, our breath through our tears, you know, we're bringing a, a kind of um, weather um, through embodiment and being in relation. Um, and I'm still working out that idea. So um, it's the first time I think I've said this publicly. <laughs> so it's taking me some time to kind of work through what that means. Um, Emily Changer is actually a curator who first suggested that, suggested that I bring weather to the museum. But I've been trying to think through, well, what does that mean? You know, what does that mean? Because I'm only one of many people who is undertaking this work, not only from my island, but across Turtle Island and elsewhere, um, where people are repatriating belongings and visiting them and working through processes to have them return to their homelands. Nina, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, I think it's really beautiful what you're saying. It resonates with so, so many. Um, there are so many different attempts to, <clears throat> to um, relate to objects, so-called artifacts, to these cultural belongings in museums. And 
very often uh, that means um, indigenous peoples around the world reclaiming those objects, maybe trying to shift the narrative, um, trying to uh, uh, question and change those museum institutions. Um, and all those, those attempts, they have their own place and their own uh, uh, struggle, their own history. Um, but your process um, is so particular of like, of trying to establish uh, its own process of relating in a contemporary way, of creating a, um, a particular relation in the present with these objects, right? It's so uh, so interesting and, and moving. It's a, a, um, a process of addressing these ancestral belongings and discovering this relation in the process, right? Can you, um, do you like to talk a little bit more about that? How, um, how this happens, how this uh, idea of um, addressing these ancestral belongings happen um, in the process of mm -hmm. activating the, this, um, this object, placing them on the body, dancing, singing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess I should start by saying in the old days, um, things like, uh, or, or beings <laughs> like masks were activated through performance, you know, through song, through dance. And of course, there's all of the sort of garments that were activated in that way as well. And other um, belongings that were activated um, and continue to be activated in performance, um, although possibly sort of in a different way at this time. And, and I, I think a little bit about how um, performance really does something in the world, you know, that songs do something in the world, that dances do something in the world. And while I work with contemporary uh, dancers, um, I still think that there is something that happens when myself or the dancers, you know, interact with those belongings, you know, at this time and in this moment. So I suppose I could say that I hadn't intended to sing to the Alutic sewing bags or Shulkviak sewing bags, but I did. Um, I kept the work silent um, in sections uh, because I wanted to keep that song for that experience between us. Um, and, you know, that was a way for me to be generous with them and to be with them. And of course, there are longer histories of people singing to them. As Gerald described, there's, you know, the ways in which we, many people sing all the way through the making, you know, through the gathering of grasses, the curing of grasses, that there's songs along the way. And I've heard that said in relation to making kayaks at home as well. Um, when I was young, I was an intern in the Aleutic Museum and I remember that there was a description of the ways in which we would sing a song for each part of building the kayak, which was built to the sort of specifications of an individual's body. You know, it was meant to fit that person. Um, and there was a process. And I guess in my work generally, I'm really interested in process um, and sort of documenting process. Um, so for example, what you're seeing now is an image of what I called an open rehearsal for camera. Um, so this is at the SF at SF MoMA's white box. Um, we had a series of open rehearsals um, in preparation for shooting the work um, in in the collection storage space at the Hearst Museum of Anthropology. Um, I guess also, you know, in this address, I'm thinking about, you know, what are my strengths? And so I sort of did an impromptu oration with these belongings, thinking about how they function in the world, asking a series of questions that I have about them and, and just being in relation to them. Because I think that in the energy of our voice, you know, there are sound waves there that are, that are these vibrations are sort of entering into that work, into th that belonging and, and staying with it. And so that's important. 
but also I think about the strength of the dancers that I'm working with and and their generousness and what they bring to this work as well. And so Ivani Abinmalo, who is in the work, um, I think we're going to Actually, I think Gerald has a question about this um, also. So maybe I'll let Gerald ask this question before, uh, before, before I move to that. I so. do. And I, yes, I do. Thank you. Um, indeed, I think the, this idea, and I, I've certainly seen elders, uh, you know, going into institutions and museums, whether it's feeding the masks or addressing uh, sacred medicine bundles uh, or something to the degree that that there's a reverence. And as you say, it's uh, because art museums and museums treat things, our things or our ancestral belongings as objects, right? Uh, when I think of objects, I often think of that as a third person where we don't talk about something because it's in third person. But it's a curious thing when when you see uh, elders or even knowledge keepers who start to address these things as, in a, as you say, in a personhood, a relationship, a subjecthood is given. So you have a conversation, you know? And I've seen that over and over and over again. And it's these kind of things that are difficult, I think, for Western viewers perhaps to comprehend. And it's just this idea. So that, that to me is so, so common. And, uh, and to me, it's that part of that cultural knowledge that the visual uh, knowledge that I talk about and, and how we have to start thinking quite differently to get out of that Western frame of mind to an indigenous frame of thinking. And in the video that I wanted to you to talk about, it shows a young lady, uh, and you'll introduce it, please, in which she's dancing. She goes up to the uh, storage facility where the uh, you were before, it seems like, and you were there before. And, but she goes up and quietly just approaches the, the, where these objects, these things are. And it's as if she's standing back and uh, she starts to dance. And to me, it's this kind of, I don't know, there's something about it. And I personally interpret it as this, this she, the objects are struggling to be released and 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 that she's creating a sovereign space so could you talk about that as 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 we play the video It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, the the dancer is Ivani Abinmalu, who I've had a chance to work with uh, since 2016 on several projects. And um, she's Maliseet, and um, we began working together in Montreal. She's trained as a contemporary dancer and also um, as a fancy shawl dancer. And um, even the, the top that she's wearing in this was a top that was gifted to her that she wears with her regalia. And she chose to wear that for the duration of this project. Um, and I, I really respect those kinds of decisions where she feels as though, I mean, our garments are very important to us in terms of, 
them being handmade and sewn and prayed over and you know presented and then worn for specific purposes um and so in this way you know i don't know why she wanted to wear that garment specifically but of course um i honor that decision and um I think it might be because we'd had such good conversations about ancestral and cultural belongings and this work that, you know, that I was undertaking and, and that I was asking the dancers to respond to, which she did and the other dancers did, uh, Kynwin Gobert and um, Dana Rosales in just really, you know, thoughtful, beautiful, generous ways. Um, but she's specifically... Uh, came to, we hadn't intended to, to shoot there in that specific place because it's an older space in the basement of Krober, what was called Krober Hall, which has now been unnamed uh, Krober Hall, <laughs> which is its own history, um, which is in the, uh, in the same building that uh, the Harris Museum of Anthropology is located in. Um, so Alfred Krober uh, is considered, you know, sort of, a really important figure in Western anthropology and in California specifically, but is also affiliated with some very contentious histories. And Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley, um, decided to unname, uh, had received a proposal and voted in favor of unnaming um, that building uh, in 2020, 2021, around there. So after this project had happened. But a sort of other unfolding um, uh, history uh, in the project was that the there was the Sonoma County or Kincaid wildfires um, in Northern California, um, which really halted the plans for the shoot that was supposed to happen in a different uh, collection storage space uh, that is more state of the art, is much more contemporary, has um, different systems in place. And I felt like that would be a better place for the dancers to be because it was you know, a bit cleaner and, you know, a bit newer. And I just felt like maybe it was a little bit of um, safer, you know, for the dancers to be in. But the UC Berkeley campus um, was notified that the entire campus would be shut down um, due to blackouts that were happening, um, uh, rolling blackouts that were happening across the Bay Area um, due to the wildfires in an effort to um, stop the... Uh, electrical grids from sparking, which were causing a number of the fires. And the electrical grids were sparking because they had not been taken care of properly over a long period of time. And so PG&E, which was the company at the time, or you know, is the company, um, has subsequently been dealing with all kinds of um, litigation as a result of, of this. Um, of these wildfires. And so that wildfire doubled in size, you know, from one day to the next. And so we were given a very short period of time before the entire campus shut down to sort of enter into that space and to uh, shoot this. And um, it wasn't at all how I had intended, you know, to do it. And then in that moment, um, I asked, I asked Ivani to do this, and um, she did. And it just became such a powerful sort of expression of being in the place where those allergic sewing bags have lived for decades. I don't even know how long. She's in direct correlation or relation to the exact um, kind of locker where they live that's, you know, locked and... Um, and I also notice, which is a little hard, um, you know, via Zoom to really sort of... Um, experience, but there's a very loud HVAC system. It's almost like a white noise that's just sort of perpetually on. And her feet are disrupting that. You know, her breath is disrupting that. And I'm sort of just outside of the view of the camera, and I'm encouraging her <laughs> as she's doing it. I'm speaking to her. I'm saying, oh, that's great. Yeah, keep going. Breathe. And so all of that's sort of happening in that moment. Um, and for me, that's sort of an extension of, you know, the songs that I sing, the oration that I share, because it's another kind of energy that she's um, exerting uh, to kind of disrupt the space, but also 
for those belongings to hear, you know, and to sense um, behind those behind those doors. Well, uh, Tanya, uh, I've worked in museums and been in museums for so many years that I feel that that's probably the reason I'm aging so gracefully. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been really, really great to have you. Thank you, Nina, um, because uh, it's just been a great, and I'm looking forward to the fall exhibition, the senior work on display and present in relation to others, to Sonia's, to other artists from across the uh, circumpolar Arctic and with the Amazon. So I really, uh, Really, it was excited to to be working with you and, and seeing you this fall. Also, wanted to thank all of you out uh, in the audience for joining us today in the Arctic Amazon Exchange Workshop on this uh, kind of a contact zones of many sorts. And I think that uh, Tanya has really addressed that in many ways, not always uh, in terms of contact with outsiders and newcomers and settlers, but rather with old friends and old relatives, right? And that are in museums. And I think that's another kind of contact zone that uh, Tonya was talking about. And uh, so I wanted to thank you for that. I, I should uh, say that this workshop is hosted once again by OCAD University in relation to Social Science and Humanities Council's uh, Connections Grant that uh, enabled us to have this series. Uh, as well to the Power Plant Gallery of, uh, of Contemporary Art there in Toronto. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge our staff because they've been so committed over the past uh, few years and working on these projects. And uh, also the university, the OCAD University's IT department who enabled this uh, conversation for us today and uh, who really do a lines work of uh, behind the work, behind the scenes to enable us to to actually uh, have something that uh, is successful. Um, I'd like uh, also to, to say that I think uh, folks out there can join us. Uh, for more information, they could uh, go on our website, wapata.com. And apparently you could follow us as well on Instagram. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how to say it, if it's wapata.ocadu, O-C-A-D-U. Uh, if that's the case, do. Uh, do do that and follow us there and and where we'll be posting dates updates uh, in future workshops we have a couple more workshops from our friends in from the amazon in south america uh, that will be coming up shortly so keep an eye on the dates there and we'll be sending them out to you and then of course the exhibition on the 30th of september at the power plant gallery of contemporary art as well we have a <clears throat> an ancillary uh, collateral event that's going to happen at, uh, at the Ryerson Image Center. Uh, so the International Collaboration of Artists, as I said, that we're bringing them together. I'll just read a couple names uh, of artists who are gonna be there besides Tonya. There's Sharon Noe Hakahiwe, Cuisine Van Wevelin, Emerson Uriah, Sonia Kelleher Combs, Olinda Silvano, Marit and Sarah, Uti Pieski, Pio Arca, and, and many others. So we look forward to seeing you there at the, even in our next workshop. And uh, thank you for attending this workshop today. And I bid you uh, all a great day. Good night.